might as well get started. It's been a while. A while. Yeah. It's been a while. A week. No. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, I got a whole uh, list of things to tell you, but I'll wait until after we get to, into any announcements. So. If you want to take your hymnals, uh, turn to page 96. We'll begin with Onward Christian Soldiers. page 50 and we will sing in the garden and after this we'll have the opening prayer by Mr. David Talley page 50 Joy we share. 
Father in heaven above, it's a great joy and a great pleasure for all of us to be able to gather again once again on your holy Sabbath day and fellowship and enjoy the company and the pleasure and hear the word spoken to us that we have been missing so much. Thank you for everybody that's here. We pray for your blessings and inspiration upon the service and just give you honor and glory and thanks for all your many great blessings and pray for your kingdom to come as soon as possible. In Jesus Christ's holy name, amen. 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 <laughs> well, uh, to start with, I've got some good news today. I was talking to Alton this morning. And uh, last week I was telling you how he, the doctor had put him on some new medicine. He was doing a lot better. Today he's even better. His strength is returning to his legs. And he says next week he's going to be here. So that's really, really good news. And I'm glad to hear that, and I know all of you are too. And it's a pleasure to be here with you, all of you again today too, and see all your smiling faces. And I uh, hope and pray to God that everything will work out so we can continue to meet together and that he'll bless us and protect us and take care of us. Uh, we all need that and for ourselves and our families and friends. And just ask God to bring an end to this terrible curse we're under. Anyway, I've got the weekly update here. It says, greetings from Tyler. You're way more likely to drown. The L.A. Times just published an article about summer and the dreaded virus. They interviewed a series of experts in molecular microbiology, immunology, boy, it's hard to say those big words, and quote from all the, from the all-knowing, all-seeing, ever-sensing CDC. Their own projections show there is much greater chance you'll drown then contract the disease in water. They estimated 10 drownings per day, and it's a wonder swimming hasn't been outlawed altogether to keep everyone safe. The CDC says there is no evidence that you can pick up the sickness from the pools, hot tubs, spas, or water play areas. <coughs> Excuse me. But as we all know and believe, more research is needed isn't it always? A USC professor of all things contagious says, I can't say it's absolutely 100% zero risk, but I can tell you it would never cross my mind to get COVID-19 from a swimming pool or the ocean. 
the head of the UCLA's Department of Epidemiology, says, there is no data that somebody got infected this way. The point is made that the virus can't live for long outside the body. You'd probably have to drink the entire lake. <laughs> Maybe this nonsense has been a blessing in disguise. At least we know now that we live in a land where official, local officials are taking their behavioral tips from some famous historical dictators. New York Mayor de Blasio says he'll drag you out of the ocean if you so much as dip a toe. Now that is something we can't wait to see. What we're experiencing as an exercise in another one of these big words here, author authoritarianism. <laughs> Hopefully, people are taking note. You might have seen the incident at the New Jersey gym where troopers showed up, determined that sensible protocol were being followed, came outside and told the assembled crowd to have a nice day amid the chants of USA, USA. After the cameras were gone and the crowd dispersed, the troopers returned and started putting, putting people in handcuffs just to keep everyone safe. Apparently, their superiors weren't amused. Who would have thought for one minute that real criminals would take advantage of a situation where lots of people are wearing masks? I guess everybody just goes around sticking everybody up with a gun now. It's good. They are considerate, protecting themselves and everyone else. Just good citizens doing their part to slow the spread until a gun is produced and they demand all the money. No one noticed when they fled. Security cameras couldn't see anything to recognize and their witnesses were all wearing the same disguise. Another benefit is that if the enterprising criminals signals extra virtue by wearing latex gloves, that means no fingerprints. They let thousands of robbers, carjackers, and dope peddlers out of prison so they wouldn't get sick. It would be better if you got robbed or killed than for the convicts to get sick, just so you know. It's utopia now. Santa Ana, California is reporting a marked increase, only about 50% so far, in holdups. It's the norm, one official said. We're seeing more and more suspects wearing the mask and using that to their benefit. The gall of criminals using the Kung flu to their benefit. First it got them out, jail, out of jail and then provided them with a disguise to mandate it by law. How do you beat that? Santa Ana police said some of the increase in crime since the lockdown started may be attributed to the release of inmates. Isn't it great when criminals can just blend in with gloves and face coverings? Let freedom ring. This place is looking more like an authoritarian socialist dictatorship run by a legion of local officials who have special privileges. No, they don't have to follow the rules they keep making and changing. The law, state constitutions, apparently allows them to issue orders that relieve us all of the national constitution protections we thought we had. Just put on your mask or maybe a hazmat suit and traipse carefully to the mailbox to pick up your government check. Isn't authoritarian socialism great? Or is freedom of speech illegal too? It is on nearly all the social media outlets. Better not spread disinformation, and that would be anything that disagrees with doctors or scientists, despite their incredible record of failure and fraud. Yes, the attitude is still not good. We're praying to a higher authority than the little dictators in masks while they wreck everything in the United States stands for. We're going to observe the Sabbath tomorrow and Pentecost next week, hopefully, 
without disturbance mark for the rest of today's services our pastor mr john wingenbach <coughs> Uh, okay, I got some announcements here. Right over here, too. Okay, uh, let's see. Next week, uh, Sabbath, we'll have a DVD. And then uh, Sunday is Pentecost. And we'll be here at the same time. And we'll be taking up an offering. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, uh, Lonnie's sister, Brenda, died this week and Lonnie's asking for prayer because his brother wants him to come up there and live with him and so they're going to try and work it out to see if he's going to go up there or if they're going to come down here uh, he really doesn't want to leave the church so he's asking all of you to pray for it if they make the right decision and it works out for the best so keep him in your prayers also, uh, Frank's mom, uh, she's got infection in her eye, and they put her on an antibiotic. So Frank, like prayer that the medicine works and works quickly and correctly and uh, does the job it's supposed to do. Uh, you all know about, uh, I think, but we went over some of this last week, but uh, the... Uh, Enters, uh, users enter at your own risk. That, that's the, the sign that they were going to put on the front door. There. Enter at your own risk. Uh, but the uh, the hall board is not encouraging or discouraging your return to active rental of the lodge. But the, he was here when we got here, and he says he's really glad that we came back. <laughs> so uh, basically, he says they had the uh, they had a cleaning crew come in Wednesday, and really clean the place he says so we have uh, sanitizers on all the tables but I see it on one table <laughs> but he says to, uh, to take the sanitizer and the paper towel and just wipe down all of the uh, tables and the chairs when you're done anything that you touched and uh, door handles you know whatever you can think of that might have been touched and he says they got a different cleaner for the kitchen tables in there. He says if you use that on these tables, it'll mess up the tables. So that's why they got a different one. Uh, and the reason he got two different ones, he had to go all the way to Wentzville to get the stuff because nobody had anything. And he said it was really expensive. So that's why they got different different cleaners. And then there's a little thing, a hand sanitizer, uh, if you want to use that. But I don't know what all this stuff is. He's, he mentioned something with bleach. I think the sanitizer had bleach in it or something. So, uh, you know, use your own discretion if you want to use sanitizer, if you want to wash your hands and, you know, soap and water and whatnot. So uh, you just don't know what some of these chemicals are for. And, what the, you know, some of the stuff you pick up, it says you're supposed to wear gloves. You ain't supposed to, you know, just take a paper towel and use them, you know. So you got to be careful. So if you do that, you know, just wash your hands when you're done so you you don't hurt yourself. Uh, but uh, I saw one picture, I think, somebody had put their kid wearing shorts in a shopping cart after it was sprayed and they got chemical burns on their legs because of whatever they used, it, was, it wasn't the right stuff or it was too strong. You know, They're so going overboard about, you know, one place is going overboard, the next place is, psst, psst, you can have this cart. <laughs> okay. Uh, but that's the situation, so. Okay. Now, Rachel, did you turn my camera on you? You got to stay on top of Rachel. Okay, let's see. What a mess. <laughs> if we ever wondered what things might look like as we enter the tribulation, 
just remember the last few months. Just everybody runs scared, everybody confused, everybody trying to figure out what to do and who's a good guy, who's a bad guy, who do you trust. Uh, the news and our wonderful leaders had everyone completely paranoid and in panic mode with panic buying. You know, the store shelves were empty. I don't need to go down a long list because you all have been living through it. <laughs> and you all know what, it, I mean, I was in the store just yesterday and it's still the same. I don't know who's, who's buying all this stuff or if the companies are not working and they're not making this stuff. But it was just like, you know, you, you walk down the aisle and, and there's no cakes, no muffins, no, you know, all the stuff that you want to bake with is, is gone. There's nothing there. The next the next day you go down, and all the canned goods are gone. You know, it's, every day it's something different. And you just don't know what is uh, what is happening, who's doing what. Uh, of course, people were uh, told and convinced that they had to stay home and not go out for months for fear that one person in a crowd might be contagious. Everybody wearing masks and wiping down everything. Now I suppose if I lived in New York, I'd probably be doing the same thing because it was so concentrated. But then I don't know why anybody would want to live in New York. <laughs> I mean, I've heard people say this, their, their city and they love it, you know, and, and uh, but the shows that I see on TV that depict the, the way things are in New York, I sure wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to live there. But in my area where I shop is a town of just over 7,000 and only six people got the disease and they all recovered. But you would think it was the other way around. You know, you, you'd think only six people didn't have it by the way that you saw every, the way everybody was acting. That, that's how that much that they have everybody completely living in fear and worry. Uh, run for your life. But, but you don't know exactly what's going on. Like the prophecy in Leviticus 26 and 36 the sound of a shaking leaf shall cause you to flee like someone is after you with a sword, although nobody is pursuing you. And that's kind of the way it was. In verse 16, he says, the guy will appoint terror over you, wasting disease and fever. Well, that's you know, kind of what uh, some of these places had. He says, you'll be hated by your enemies. China's revenge. I think this virus could have been retaliation for the trade war to destroy the economy of America and Europe. We will see. But I thought it was ironic that the stay at home order was issued just before Passover. When, when we look at the original Passover, God told his people to stay home, don't leave their house until death had passed by. In their case, it was the avenger, death angel as we say it. Uh, in our case, it was the virus. In case you don't remember that verse, I'm going to read that verse, Exodus chapter 12, uh, verse 22. And you shall take a bunch of of hyssop, dip it in blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two door posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two door posts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come in to your houses to strike you. I thought that was kind of an interesting analogy for the time when it happened. God does tell us to obey our leaders as long as they aren't contrary 
to him. And I'm going to read that in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 and verse 1, he says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So God tells us to obey. They're there for our for our good, you know. They're 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 to help us. Let us know things that we don't know, and we and we can't understand or figure out. But. We need to apply some common sense to what they say. You know, it really wasn't one size fits all, and that's what they did. They threw everybody in it together. What applied in New York really didn't apply in rural America. The county that I live in, at the very beginning, had two cases, and it never changed. That's all we've ever had was two cases in the whole county. The one county to the southwest of me has had two cases in the whole county. That's it. The other county to the southeast of me has had eight cases in the whole county. That's three whole counties together, 100,000 people, and they've had 12 cases. So stay indoors. Keep your blinds down. Don't let the sun in. Put your mask on while you're in the house. You might breathe something. You see the commercials, people walking around doing the commercials, and they'll, they're walking around their house with their mask on. I'm saying, what are you afraid of? You go outside and get fresh air, and you take your mask on. Uh, they got people completely scared. Because when you take God out of the picture, you get chaos. Now, this all gives us a glimpse of how things can change. Issue an emergency order, scare everyone to death, and then rule over them. Because they're afraid to do something else. They don't know. Whatever you tell us, we will do. We look at some of the prophecies and we say, well, that's a type. So I'm going to turn over to Matthew 24. Because when I saw some of these things, I said, well, boy, that uh, sounds a little familiar. Uh, Matthew 24. And in verse 10. He says, And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. As I was checking on the guidelines for some of the counties, what their restrictions were and what you can do, what you can't do, and uh, reading through the things on, on the internet, I scroll down to the bottom and there's a form letter that you can type out to, to send to them, email to them, so you can tell on your neighbor. If you see them violating some regulations, some rule, some ordinance that they said, and that's, that's just a glimpse of what it's going to be. But we issue an order, and we're in charge, and we want you to tell us if your neighbor doesn't abide by that. Uh, so verse 5, he says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Well, the TV, the Internet, the radio, that's all day long, all night long. You got everybody's brother on there telling you <laughs> everything, deceiving everyone. <clears throat> you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And again, we hear that in the news daily, every day. Somebody's fighting somebody. Somebody's, you know, some country's fighting some other country. It's, and it's everywhere. It's all over the globe. 
Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. And pestilence, if you look that up, uh, the Old Testament and your dictionary agree the word pestilence means disease epidemic. Well, we got that. This is causing food shortages, this epidemic, because you, you, you know, you've seen the news. Uh, one pork plant after another is closing down. And uh, I just saw where one plant, I think it was in North Carolina, had almost like 400 people were contaminated. Uh, one quarter billion people to face hunger and starvation is that famine. Earthquakes in various places. <laughs> Again, that's almost daily. If you if you have some kind of access to, to who's reporting what, there's uh, several earthquakes every week because we have instant communication. We know these things, and and that is also part of the idea of the prophecy. When Jesus gave the prophecy, well, how would they know living at that time in that place that there was earthquakes in various places? You know, two years later, somebody wrote a letter to them from some place that they got and said, oh, there was an earthquake the other day. <laughs> well, gee, that's old news. But today, we have instant communication, and we know there was two earthquakes in the Mediterranean Sea this week, in case you didn't know that. There was one off the uh, coast of uh, Nicaragua. There was one in Iran, uh, and that's just, you know, in the last week. So, they're everywhere. That's just an everyday occurrence. Verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. The beginning of sorrows, which means, the word sorrows means birth pangs. When these things happen, if they were to happen now, as bad as it would be, God wants us to remember it is the beginning of birth pains. Our birth pains. As we prepare to be born again into the family of God. When these things happen, and we know it, that is what to focus on. It's like setting your alarm clock. It's a wake-up call. When these things happen and we know it, we can sit up and say, Wow, seven years until my birth. Hallelujah. We're not there yet. All these are just the beginning. Our nation rising up against nation? Yes, all around the world. Do we have a global pestilence? Yes. Do we have earthquakes everywhere? Yes. Is famine next? Here's a news article. Locust swarms threaten the Middle East, India, Africa, Jordan, Iraq, Iran, and the Arabian Peninsula. Iran, one million hectares, seven billion in crops destroyed. One square kilometer swarm of locusts can eat the same amount of food in one day as 35,000 people. They can travel up to 93 miles in a day. You wouldn't think a little insect could fly that far. 93 miles in a day. One swarm in Kenya was three times the size of New York City. So you can imagine what they're doing each and every day, taking the food away from 100,000 or more people every day. While there are no famines currently, the World Food Program says multiple famines of biblical proportion could happen in the next few short months. They say the world is facing a hunger pandemic. 
So, is famine next? Global famine? Not until Jesus Christ begins to open the seven seals, which doesn't happen until God is ready to begin the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. We're not there yet. If you go back almost two years to my sermon on the 70 weeks, part one and two, uh, I made a comment at the time. I said, I think we have at least 10 years. And that seems like a long time. You think, well, we got 10 years. But when you realize that the last seven years are the tribulation and turmoil, well, then we only got three years. And since I made that comment almost two years ago, my question now is, are the dominoes beginning to fall? Germany takes over the European Union in July. Europe is looking to Germany for a savior. That man of sin, the little horn, the king of the north, we think will come from Germany riding a white horse with a bow and a crown going forth to conquer. Then we will be at verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. How close are we now? What if this pandemic had hit in November? And all the businesses had to close at Christmas. No Black Friday with people lined up around the block, camping out for a day or two to be first in line to get their prize that they want. No Christmas Eve. What if it comes back? COVID-19 is what it's called. Well, what will COVID-20 be? You talk about depression. If people couldn't have Christmas, personally and economically, they would be ruined. They would just absolutely fall apart. It would almost be at the point where they want to do the proverbial 1929 and start jumping off of buildings. I mean, look what they're doing right now, what they've been doing for the last month. Radio and television. To get you happy while you're going through this, they're having Christmas music and Christmas programs because that's supposed to cheer everybody up, make everybody happy. It's Christmas again. And then they give you money so you can go out and buy stuff. Last Sunday, I was in Walmart trying to get my groceries, and the guy in front of me, I had to wait for him. They had to bring in a special uh, cart for him because he had a big old giant television. He had a big stereo DVD player. I mean, he, he took his check to Walmart and loaded up everything that he wanted. It was Christmas for him. Well, whether intentional or accidental, this virus has wrecked economies all over the world. The European Union just about fell apart. Each nation closed their borders. They wouldn't let anybody cross from back and forth. And everyone, including here in the United States, looking to the government for solutions and help. How many of these things are a prelude to the mark of the beast? No one can buy or sell. Well, if they close your store, you can't sell. Unless you have some mark that says you can stay open. Essential. Do you have the mark? Are you essential? And if the store is open, why, you can't buy unless you have permission to be there. Uh, maybe a mask? maybe certain hours? How about seniors can only shop on Saturday morning? 
we'd all be in trouble, wouldn't we? But that's the way that they're testing the waters. What can they do? What can they get away with? How can we control? Was this all an experiment in population control, a type of fear religion? You listen to me and do what I say or you're going to die. That's what fear religion is. You do what I tell you, you're going to burn hell forever. Sizzle pop. You leave this church and you're going to go straight to hell. That's the way a lot of these churches are. It's fear religion. Four point five billion people were confined to their homes. But that's okay. We'll have a concert. One world together at home. And we'll practice socialism and social distancing. And so it was. There's been some talk about Psalm 91. So I want to look at Psalm 91. Psalm 91. It says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Where do you dwell? In the secret place? Psalm 32. I'm going to read one verse here. You can read the whole thing yourself if you want. But Psalm 32 and verse 7 says, You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. And then if we look at Colossians... Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3 he says for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God see when well, we went through the process of baptism and laying our laying on of hands we died just like Christ under the waters of baptism and now our life is hidden with Christ in God so where do you dwell? With Christ in God? If not, the rest of Psalm 91 doesn't apply to you. Romans chapter 8, one verse here. Romans 8 and verse 9. He says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And so, if you haven't gone through that process, you're not his. And your life isn't hidden with Christ in God. So you're not in the secret place. But we are in that place. Psalm 91, verse 2. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Again, disease epidemic. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. His truth even the spirit of truth who is in us is our shield unless of course you reject his truth which the world does the majority of the world rejects God's truth they pick and choose I like this I don't agree with that. I can do this. I can't do that.
You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Don't be afraid, he says. Trust God. The pestilence that walks in darkness, because, you know, it was it's the hidden enemy. We can't see the virus. And again, pestilence is the disease epidemic. And the fact that they keep mentioning that, you have to figure it's coming. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward of the wicked. You have to wonder if some of the people in New York were thinking that when thousands were falling left and right. What is going on? Where am I? Why is that? He says, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. God is your dwelling place. Your life is hid with Christ in God. That's where you dwell. That's why you're saved. Verse 10. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling which is your your home. No plague should come near your home. No evil shall befall you because God is your dwelling place. Remember what Jesus said in John 14. He says, In my Father's house are many mansions. The word mansions means dwellings. We are those dwellings. God is is our dwelling place and we are his they have made their home with us verse 11 for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone you shall tread upon the lion and the cobra the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot as long as we aren't tempting God like Satan did, but we remain obedient. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. We have shown God that we love him by obedience Jesus said if you love me keep my commandments and so he will deliver us and lift us up because we have known his name I'll digress for a moment when this was written his name was Yahweh God of the Old Testament then, born of Mary, his name in Hebrew was Yahushua, which means Yahweh is salvation. That became shortened to Yahshua. And in Aramaic, it was Yeshua. If you remember the movie, if you saw the movie, Passion of the Christ, and you listen, you'll hear Mary calling to Jesus over and over again, Yeshua, Yeshua because that was the spoken language at the time of the common people was Aramaic. Well, the Aramaic, Yeshua, was then translated into the Greek, which is Jesus, and in English, Jesus, and the Y changed to the J became Jesus. And by the way, there was nothing wrong with knowing the name of the person you love. You love God, you should know his name. You know, Jesus said in John 17, verse 26, in his prayer, just before his betrayal, 
He says, I have declared to them your name and will declare it because of love. That's why he said. The Jerusalem Bible and the New Jerusalem Bible, which is the preferred Bible for European Catholics, uses the name Yahweh throughout. How else do you think the beast and false prophet will blaspheme God's name? They will use it themselves in all kinds of lies. And when the man of sin claims to be God, he may even use God's name. Just uh, on the side, if you spend a little time in your concordance, you will see that the name of the prophets, the original name of the prophets, like Elijah was Eliyahu, Jeremiah was Jeremiah, Isaiah was Yeshayahu, and even Matthew knows his name in Hebrew is Matthew, because that's what God's name was. And way back, about 200 BC, they changed that because the, when the Greeks came into the whole scene, the Jews were afraid that they were going to misuse God's name. So they changed a couple of letters and they substituted the A and the U for E and O for Elohim. That's why when you read, you see Jehu this and Jeho that. Jehoshaphat and all that because they changed the letters because they were at the beginning of the name but when it was at the end of the name they left it the same and it's still that way today uh, in the uh, complete Jewish Bible or if you're one of these people who are just uh, fortunate enough to actually have your name in the Bible Benjamin is in the Bible. Netanyahu is in the Bible. <laughs> you can find it in your concordance. It's, I think that's kind of uh, interesting. Verse 15. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble and I will deliver him and honor him. And with long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation we call upon him and he will answer us he will be with us he will deliver us he will honor us he will satisfy us and he will show us his salvation why because we love him and we know him and we are his let's look at Psalm 23 Psalm 23, since everyone knows this one. Psalm 23 and verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Who is our shepherd? Well, there's several verses. We look at John chapter 10 and verse 14. He says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep and am known by my own. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13 and in verse 20 says, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And 1 Peter 
chapter 5 and verse 4 he says and when the chief shepherd appears you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away so the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want I trust that no one lacked or was in want of anything important for the last couple of months. Verse 2, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. God brings me calm and peace. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. He gives me peace of mind, relieves the stress, helps me to do right for his name's sake. Because if God didn't lead us in the path of righteousness, where would we go? Follow everybody else down the road to destruction. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, they tried to make us believe we were doing that every time we had to leave our home. Don't go out. You'll be walking through the shadow, the valley of death. And yet, he says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We didn't fear the evil. We knew God was with us. And that was comfort. We didn't have to worry. All we had to do was trust God. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. In other words, God took care of us, provided for us, and let us know that we are his. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God will be with us now and forever. So for us, this was an exercise in trusting God. Don't fear, remain calm, stay obedient, Believe and keep the faith. That's the way you have to look at this this past couple months. It was just an exercise in trusting God. Who are you going to rely on? Are you going to rely on the media and the government and all the leaders that are telling you this, that, and the other thing? Or are you going to trust God? Just remain calm. You know, people have been talking about cabin fever because they had to stay home only to go out once a week. And somebody, some of them didn't even go out once a week. They, that was part of the panic buying. We could only go out once every three weeks or so, you know, just you, you had to be real careful, who, you know, because the virus is going to get you. So they just stayed home. And they talk about cabin fever. Well, what about the guy and his family that was stuck on a boat with no windows and no doors, no fresh air, and no toilet paper for a whole year with a bunch of wild animals? And finally, to get to see outside, to get to go outside, and to find out every, every living creature on earth was dead talk about a new normal. Noah, one of eight people, left alive. And yet that was God's protection during the day of his wrath, when he destroyed everything on earth. Gee, we didn't have it so bad at all, did we? 
just a little inconvenience. I mean, the only thing that I missed was going to church. Other than that, didn't nothing was different. You know the old sayings. You look far enough, somebody's always got it worse. You know, you can always find somebody that that uh, has it worse than you, and gives you reason to be thankful. I can't even imagine what was going on in their mind being stuck in that boat for a year. No windows, no doors. I know they had to stay busy taking care of the animals. And there had to be a lot of miracles in order to provide fresh water and food for everybody. But uh, they couldn't go outside. <laughs> They didn't have a choice. You know, when they went in that boat, God sealed the door. They couldn't get out. God was going to save them whether they liked it or not. <laughs> well, the next episode will be worse. They like to think, oh, things are going to get better. Well, on the scheme of things, they're gradually going to get worse round by round by round. It may get better, but then it's going to get the next round. The next round will be worse. So, remember then how you got through this one and learn any lessons you can so you can apply it to the next round when it happens. Are we there yet? Well, it depends on what you mean by there. If you mean the tribulation, no. The 70th week of Daniel has not begun yet, but recent events have speeded things up. And again, I'd say go back if you want details and listen to the 70th week, part one and two, or two witnesses and the little horn, if you uh, want some more details. But when we get there, you will see a beast sign a treaty, a holy site dedicated, sacrifices begin, two witnesses preaching with power, wars, famine, pestilence, and death on a global scale. Yes, this pandemic has killed 330,000 people so far. But remember, December 26, 2004. 9.0 earthquake and the tsunami that followed killed 230,000 people in hours. Didn't take months and months, just hours. The reality is, we ain't seen nothing yet. When Jesus opens the first seal, and that last week of seven years begins, then it all begins. Never forget, God is in control. It is all in his authority. That last week, that last seven years, the tribulation, the heavenly signs, and the day of the Lord, won't begin until God holds out his hand to Jesus, and Jesus takes the scroll and removes the first seal. But there are a lot of things that will lead up to it, just like what we've been living through. They're all a precursor, events that are going to lead up to the big events. Lots of chaos, unrest, fear, uncertainty, turning to government instead of to God, everyone out for himself. Preparing the world to look for a Savior <clears throat> that will come as a man of sin. Are we there yet? No. But we may be real close.
Okay, if you'd like to take your hymnals, turn to page 45. And after this, we'll have the closing prayer by Mr. Dan Albrecht. Page 45. Father, thank you for this powerful message that we just heard. Lord, I pray for your continued protection and your guidance as we deal with all these things that have to come. Lord, please be with us again till we can we can uh, meet to celebrate your wonderful Sabbath day. Keep us all safe and holy and, and, and free from this virus and, and other things that may happen. Thank you, Lord, for all things you've done for us. Amen. <clears throat> 